This is Michael Altos, recording uptake and distribution of inhalational anesthetics, part one. We're moving on now to inhalational anesthetics. And as somebody who studied a lot of pharmacology before I came into anesthesia, I thought I understood pharmacology pretty well. And so I found the whole subject of inhalational anesthetics to be very confusing. Uh, it seemed like everything was sort of moving in an opposite direction from what I was used to when I thought about giving an IV drug and watching it distribute throughout the body. So I encourage you to spend lots of time on this subject. Read the chapter a few times. Listen to these lectures a few times uh, because it can be a little bit counterintuitive and it takes some time to digest the concepts in this subject. I don't think anything we do in pharmacology is very difficult but if anything is more difficult, this would be it. By way of introduction, inhalational anesthetics are a very interesting and effective way to deliver medication to the body. They have a very rapid onset of action and a very fast change in level of anesthesia. We can increase and decrease patients' plane of anesthesia very rapidly. This allows for fast turnovers. It allows for fast recovery times for patients to go home after surgery. And actually, these drugs are remarkably safe, and we can give quite a bit of anesthesia, and under our supervision, patients can be very safe. It's also a unique way of delivering drug to the body. We're giving drug through the lungs, and the lungs are one of the only organs that get 100%, 100% of cardiac output with every beat of the heart. So we have a very open venue to deliver medication to the body. We start by asking what exactly is general anesthesia? And this is a sort of a vague question. There are different definitions of general anesthesia. On one hand, we say amnesia is general anesthesia, that people don't remember what happened to them. Uh, this is our most sen se sensitive anesthetic endpoint, and it occurs in various parts of the central nervous system, like the hippocampus, the amygdala, and the temporal lobe, areas associated with memory and emotion. And if we look here in this orange line, we see that as we start giving more and more general anesthesia, the number of people who respond, and by respond we mean remember, drops off from 100% eventually down to almost none, somewhere around this 0.2 to 0.3, 0.4 MAC range. Unconsciousness is a little bit different. For someone to be totally unconscious and unresponsive occurs not at these areas of emotion and memory, but more at your consciousness centers, your cerebral cortex, your thalamus, the reticular formation in your uh, brainstem. And sedation, hypnosis are all points along the spectrum of consciousness. And we see that you need more anesthesia to achieve unconsciousness. Finally, there's immobility for a patient to not move under anesthesia. And that can be achieved, but it requires quite a bit more anesthesia. Patients can be unconscious and amnestic, but still move under anesthesia. So you can see we need a lot more anesthesia. And this occurs at the spinal cord and maybe in the brain as well. And then people talk about analgesia, which isn't actually provided by most of our general anesthetics. And analgesia occurs at different peripheral and central receptors. So when we ask what general anesthesia is, we need to define exactly what we're describing when we mean general anesthesia. And we look at the different kinds of substances that can cause general anesthesia, and it's remarkable because we have everything ranging from inner elements to simple inorganic compounds, hydrocarbons, and even complex organic structures, which can all be given to achieve this clinical state that basically looks like general anesthesia, even though they are all different molecules and may actually all be working at different sites in the body and different receptors. General anesthesia is sort of the final common clinical pathway for all of these different agents. Well, how does anest general anesthesia work? And it seems that each agent has its own mechanism and its own receptor and its own target. And different kinds of general anesthesia, that is uh, more along the lines of consciousness versus amnesia versus immobility, may also have different mechanisms. And so it can become very complicated to define general anesthesia. At one point, there was a unitary hypothesis which said that everything must have a common mechanism of action and they looked for different possible mechanisms. The famous Meyer-Overton rule said that potency correlates with lipid solubility. And you can find this graph in a, a textbook that shows that the more lipid-soluble drugs tended to be more potent. 
but there were some exceptions to this rule. There were other theories like binding to lipid bilayers and making it expand or disturbing membrane form or conductance. But I think if there's one point you really need to know about all of this, it's simply that nowadays we believe that most general anesthesia occurs due to binding to some sort of ion channel protein. It could be GABA receptors or glycine receptors, nicotinic acetylcholine receptors or NMDA receptors are all examples of ion channel proteins. And it seems that pretty much every general anesthetic interacts with one of these ion channel proteins in some way. We'll take a moment for you to consider any questions you might have, and then we'll move on. Now we're going to switch gears and start talking about some basic science concepts. We're going to start with partial pressure. Partial pressure is a concept you should have learned in a introductory physics class. The idea is it's the pressure a gas exerts in a system proportional to its fractional mass. So if there are three different gases in a system and one gas is 20% of the system, its partial pressure will be 20% of the total pressure of the system. And partial pressures are additive. So the best example would be our atmosphere. If we say that atmosphere pressure is 760 millimeters of mercury, which it is for some of you at sea level in Houston, then we know that oxygen occupies 21% of the atmosphere and nitrogen 79% of the atmosphere. So the partial pressure of oxygen in the atmosphere is 21% of 760. It's 160 millimeters of mercury. And the partial pressure of nitrogen is 600 millimeters of mercury, 79% of 760. And when you add the two together, you get the full atmospheric pressure of 760 millimeters of mercury. This neglects all of the other trace gases in the environment. And if I took all of the oxygen out of, let's say, a big container, and I left only the nitrogen, then the pressure of nitrogen in that container would be 600 millimeters of mercury. This is partial pressure. And we're going to think about this a little bit more because people get confused when we start talking about pressures and concentrations. Pressure is something we think about in a gas phase. People get that you put pressure in a tire or in a container or in an atmosphere and it exerts some pressure. The gas exer exer exerts pressure. And people get concentration. I dissolve something in some liquid and however I dissolve, how much I dissolve, even if it's gas, I dissolve some gas in a liquid in a solution. And solubility is just how much gas I can dissolve in a volume of liquid. What people get confused about is when we talk about the partial pressure of gas in a solution, people say, well, what does that mean? How can you have pressure in a solution? I like to think of it as the force that gas is using to try to escape out of solution. Think of carbon dioxide in a bottle of soda. And there's concentration of carbon dioxide. It's dissolved a certain amount of gas in this volume of water. But there's also a pressure in there, isn't there? It's how hard that concentration of of gas is trying to escape out of the liquid. And it doesn't matter that it's totally filled from bottom to top with liquid. It's got a driving pressure trying to get out of liquid. And in fact, if I take this bottle and I empty it part way, so now I have a liquid with some gas dissolved in it. And then some of that gas does escape the liquid phase and it goes into this little pocket of air and it makes an equilibrium here. And if I measure the pressure of gas in this phase, that is the same as the pressure of gas in this phase because partial pressure, or just in this case pressure, is how gas equilibrates. The pressure of gas here is the same as the pressure of gas there. So take a moment and think about this, and then we're going to start applying this concept in the next slide. If gases equilibrate based on partial pressures, then we can set up this sort of theoretical experiment. Let's imagine that we have the same container that we had in the previous slide, and then we connect it to a second identical container filled with a different liquid. And now we fill these containers, these two connected containers with gas. So the gas dissolves in the first liquid to some concentration we'll call C1. And there's a pressure associated with that, and the gas has a certain drive to escape being dissolved, and it populates this air phase, this gas phase, with a certain pressure. And obviously, because these two chambers are connected, it's the same pressure of gas on both sides.
and the gas encounters this second liquid, let's say it's oil, and some of the gas dissolves in this liquid. In fact, the gas is really soluble in oil, so a lot of gas dissolves here. But over time, the whole system becomes equilibrated, and now what we see is the gas is not very soluble in water. It's very soluble in oil, so we have two different concentrations of gas. Obviously, this partial pressure needs to be the same because it's all connected, and we can say that the partial pressure in each of these three compartments, liquid one, liquid two, and the gas, is all the same partial pressure. Gases equilibrate based on partial pressures. And we could even remove the whole gas phase of this um, system and just put these two containers next to each other with a permeable membrane. And now we have a concentration of gas in the water phase and a concentration of gas in the oil phase. And the gas moves freely between the two based on these concentrations. And we say that they have the same partial pressure. This is a very important concept for us to understand because now we are thinking about um, gases moving from the lungs to the blood, from the blood to other tissues, and so on. Just to make things a tiny bit more confusing, by convention we don't usually talk about partial pressures in the body. We talk about fractional concentrations. And this just simply means that we don't say 160 millimeters of mercury of oxygen. We say 21% oxygen. So if F is always proportional to P, we just tend to speak in terms of percent of atmospheric pressure instead of the raw partial pressure. And this actually is a little bit too bad because your body doesn't really need 21% oxygen. Your body needs 160 millimeters of mercury of oxygen. So this is a little bit misleading, but this is how people normally speak, and we always assume that you're more or less at atmospheric pressure. It's interesting, if you go to a very high altitude, the fraction of oxygen, the FO2, is still 21%, but since atmospheric pressure is so much lower, it won't be 160 millimeters of mercury. And so at high altitudes, when you breathe 21% oxygen, it's not enough. And you actually need to breathe a higher FO2 to achieve adequate tissue oxygenation. Let's stop here to have you consider some questions. Go back over this material a few times if you need to, and then we'll continue on. Now we're going to talk about delivery of the inhaled anesthetic to a patient. Remember that our goal is to establish a concentration of anesthetic agent in the central nervous system, because that's where these agents primarily work. Remember this very important relationship that when a system is at equilibrium, the partial pressure of gas in the CNS is equal to the partial pressure of gas in the blood, which is equal, equal to the partial pressure of gas in the alveoli, in the lungs. We know that partial pressures equilibrate. Gases equilibrate based on partial pressures. So when a system is at equilibrium, if we can measure how much gas is in the patient's lungs, we know the same partial pressure is in the patient's brain. And that is our goal. And gases transfer rapidly between these three compartments. At equilibrium, if you know the partial pressure of gas in the alveoli, then you know the partial pressure in the CNS. I just want to remind you that we don't always speak in partial pressures. We speak in F in fractions. So we don't say, ah, oh, the patient is on 7.6 millimeters of mercury of isoflurane, which would be the partial pressure. We say they're on 1% isoflurane, which is 1% of 760 is 7.6, and that's the fractional concentration. We could say that gases equilibrate based on fractional concentrations as well, but that's a little bit too confusing and it's easier to just stick to this basic relationship. And once again, since fractional concentration is proportional to partial pressure, if the patient's got 1% isoflurane in their lungs and we're at equilibrium, then they have 1% isoflurane in their brain as well. Once again, I should remind you that physiologically, these gases work based on partial pressure in the brain, not fractional concentration. <clears throat> again, your brain needs not 1% isoflurane, your brain needs 7.6 millimeters of mercury of isoflurane. And at higher altitudes, you need a higher percent, a higher fractional concentration to get that same partial pressure. 
And if you look at your SIBO fluorine vaporizer, it says it's calibrated 1%, 2%, and so on. But actually, it's really calibrated to deliver a set partial pressure. And it only delivers 1% SIBO fluorine when atmospheric pressure is 760. And if you take that vaporizer up to Denver or higher, up to some place where atmospheric pressure is very low, it will still deliver 7.6 millimeters of mercury of sevoflurane, but it won't be 1%, even though your dial says 1%, it'll be 2%. And this is true for all of our vaporizers except desflurane. And we'll talk about that a little bit more, um, I think, next week. So having discussed that, we're going to think about solubility. <clears throat> solubility, referred to by this Greek letter here, lambda, <clears throat> sometimes it's called the solubility coefficient or the partition coefficient, and there are many of them. Usually we're talking about the blood gas partition coefficient, and this describes the ratio of concentrations of anesthetic gas dissolved in each of the two phases, blood and gas, at equilibrium. Remember, partial pressures are equal but concentrations are not. This is so important for you to remember. When a gas is called soluble, which means that its partition coefficient is greater than one, it means that there's more agent in the blood phase and less agent at the gas phase in equilibrium. The partial pressures are the same, but the concentration is higher in the blood phase and lower in the gas phase. And so you need to dissolve more and more gas until you can generate a certain partial pressure because it's so soluble. When something is low solubility, its partition coefficient is less than one. It means there's less agent in the blood and more in the gas phase. The, the agent is not very soluble in the blood. And so you don't need as much gas. You need less gas in order to generate a certain partial pressure. And there are many other partition coefficients not only blood to gas, but there's brain to blood, muscle to blood, fat to blood. They all just describe how gas moves between one environment and another. And again, partial pressures equilibrate, but how does the gas partition itself in terms of where is it going to have a higher and a lower concentration? <clears throat> this is a good place to stop. We've covered quite a bit of material, and I really do encourage you to go over this several times in the notes, in the book, in these recorded lectures. Um, so, and then in class we'll try to use this information and understand it a little bit more practically. <clears throat>